Hi, welcome to Shift, PwC Canada's podcast series, and we're digging into key digital trends and topics that can make your business transformation a reality. I'm your host, John Finkelstein, and I'm also the creative director of PwC Canada. Today, we're talking about building a city of innovation with our special guest today, Councillor Michelle Holland. You're the chief advocate for the innovation economy at the city. That's an amazing title. Tell me more about that. Thanks. Well, I'm excited to be here and thank you so much for inviting me. The first thing I'd like to say is that we, we're a city that's leading. And what we found was that instead of being reactive, which is what happens with many governments, we wanted to be proactive. So now I'm leading the charge on different multifaceted fronts at the city. Primarily, one of the areas that I'm covering is to be collaborative within the different areas of the ecosystem. We have the public institutions, we have private institutions, uh, we have corporations, we have educational systems, also in terms of gender diversity. So we're hearing a lot about women in tech. A lot of people talk about how do you actually move the dial with women in tech. I also happen to work with Jody Kovitz and her Move the Dial initiative. But in terms of the city, what can we actually do? What I've been doing is making sure that within our most important corporations that we're actually placing women onto those corporate boards. Another area that I've been primarily uh, focusing on is talent, so the attraction and the retention of talent within the city. When I first took over the role in a formal way, I put together an advisory panel. It's actually an advisory panel full of uh, people across the ecosystem which is quite amazing. And they provide me feedback on what the city should do and the actions the city should take in terms of the innovation economy. And so in terms of that, we've been advancing and making sure that we're doing everything that we can do to attract and retain talent within the city. There's a lot of really exciting stuff going on in Toronto. I mean, we're... We're blowing up. It's, it's almost like every day you read something new, whether it's, you know, the Amazon's coming in. There's all sorts of excitement, I would say, around our city. And I'd love to get your thoughts on why Toronto? But what do you think it is about about Toronto that's so attractive to the tech industry? Well, that's a a loaded question. And there's a thousand reasons why I could say that Toronto is the place to be. First and foremost, what I've noticed over the past few years is that it's our time. We're absolutely exploding in terms of our tech and innovation ecosystem. There's multiple rankings, as you know, we read them all the time about Toronto being the most livable city. The Economist placed us number four out of 140. We're diverse, we're inclusive, which you're not finding as much in the US. So that's another angle that we've been working on there and just sort of having a reverse brain drain, bringing everybody back to Toronto, even from the Valley. We have a deep well of knowledge. That's one of the main pivotal points that I've, I found off of the advisory group. And when we did a deep dive into our own ecosystem was looking at, we have eight fabulous education institutions right in Toronto between our universities and our colleges. We have a deep well of talent because of that. They're producing amazing and highly qualified and highly talented and educated people within the ecosystems to draw from. You're planning a campaign to promote Toronto. Can you share a little bit of themes? So what we found was the fact that Toronto is punching above its weight. But how do we tell that in a concise way to the world? How do we have an elevator pitch? Or how does the mayor go abroad or I go abroad? And when we're in these other cities, how do we give that pitch? And what is the pitch? So we're in collaboration to work together with Toronto Global and a number of other organizations to make sure that we are able to provide that brand and and tell that narrative in the story. You're going to tell me the narrative? Can I hear it? I'm curious now. So it's these pieces of Toronto being a livable city. It's being the fact that we're one of the least expensive places to set up your business in terms of if we're going to do the top rankings from the top cities in North America, it's most affordable for the talent. You have a deep well of knowledge here with the institutions. You have your financial sector based here. So if you go to the Valley or you go to Boston, that's not the case. There isn't another city in North America that has it all like Toronto does. In one year, we've added over 21,000 jobs to the tech sector. We have over 200,000 jobs alone within the tech sector. And we've been ranked three out of 10, number three out of 10 as the best tech hub in the world. We have all of these accolades and these rankings and this city that's the most livable. 
So we have to make sure that when we get that narrative going, that we have the ecosystem working together to shout out that brand in a cohesive way. I have a question. So I was interviewing someone else, and I don't know whether this is a good question or not, so we'll yeah. see how it goes. It was more on the startup funding side of things, right? So this particular individual, I think he said he takes 500 meetings a year right? on new tech, startup, this kind of stuff, which is a ton. And not every meeting is, you know, leads to something. But one of the things that he said was he loved to be able to see Canada help companies scale. He thinks that there's a scale problem. So it's a great place to innovate. It's a great place to start. But he's worried that unlike the U.S. or other parts of the world, we just can't achieve scale out of Canada. What do you think about that? That's really interesting because that's a dialogue that I've had numerous times with people and was a concern, I would say, a few years ago and seems to be changing. We were getting a huge amount of accolades as being startup city, startup nation. Toronto was the place to do a startup and it was you have that funding and that backing to create that. And the problem was the selling out before it was the scaling up. And now I think that that's what's changed. And I'm actually hearing from a lot of companies from Hubba to Shopify to Echobee. We've actually done the work of identifying those companies that are scaling up. Whether they will sell before a unicorn, I mean, there's a lot of talk about the fact there's a belief that Toronto needs a unicorn in order to make and place our stamp in the world. Whether that's true or not true, I mean, that's for the ecosystem to really provide and to generate. But in terms of scaling up, I think that Toronto has now become that city to scale up. So I think that that was a good point a few years ago, but I do see that changing. And I think that moving forward, we're going to see that more and more. What are the top three things you're most excited about in relation to innovation and disruption happening in our city? There's so many. There's so many. I think what differentiates Toronto from the pack, the number one is obviously our diversity and inclusion. And I would put women in tech as part of that as well, or at least women in technology and innovation and scientists as well. We have a unique identifier with the city in terms of our ability to include and accept people from over 300 nations around the world. We have over 200 languages here in Toronto. So no matter where you come from in the world, you can make your place and space at home here in Toronto. So that would be one. Number two, I would say the collaboration. Again, even a short few years ago, it seemed that we were not as cohesive as what we are today. You see the ecosystem really coming together. There's a number of key events that have happened, that are happening, that are in the works to happen here in Toronto. We've got major events from Elevate. We've got Collision coming to Toronto. And that's a way for the ecosystem to come together. And I would just say that Toronto's where it's at. This is our time. I mean, where else can you go in the world, really, to be in a city that is exploding on the tech scene like Toronto? The ability to come in here into the city and do the things that you want to do and be able to start up or scale up your company, there's nowhere else that you can do it where you have the financial access, that you have the financial sector here in Toronto and the VC backing that you can do it. Absolutely, yeah. So inclusion, uh, collaboration, Mm -hmm. and Toronto's where it's at. You got it. TM. You got it. (laughs) You got it. Amazing, yeah. It's... uh, So I'm wondering, this may be tangential, I don't know, but, you know, I'm reading a lot about various cities across the world, smart cities, all that kind of stuff. And I don't know whether this is in your purview or not, so forgive me if it's not, but do you see a lot of the innovation that's happening in our city translating to smart city and infrastructure and, you know, helping sort of citizens get access and that kind of good stuff? Absolutely. Well, I just came back from Barcelona from the Smart Cities Summit and uh, and the expo. So it was fabulous to be there and seeing what in ways that we're advancing and uh, and also ways that we could be. We had recent Bloomberg funding and uh, we set up a civic innovation office. And one of the areas that they're looking at is even 311. So obviously 311, you've got the you're going to eventually have AI and you'll have disruption within that world. But how do we make sure that we're upgrading our systems and so residents can have access and also that there's a modernization within the system? So there's a few quick examples before you could not get your ferry tickets online. And now, wow, you can get your ferry tickets online. I mean, these, they seem basic, but they're ways in which the city is advancing. With the Civic Innovation Office, we're also looking at procurement. 
Now, that's a major area that we're looking at, not just the policy, but how we can work with that policy framework in order to make sure that we're working with companies that would not have access prior and they're able to have that access into and apply to the city and we can work with them in a way that we've never done before. So there's a lot happening in the city and that we're doing and that we're evolving and uh, growing and um, smart cities is one aspect for sure. I'm curious. So do you find like within council, is there is there resistance on anybody's part or is everybody kind of like super into it and they see it? Because we work with big organizations. We work both in, in private and public sector. And it's kind of a, it's a bit of a mixed bag in terms of how people look at innovation. So historically, governments have been great at blocking innovation or at least tampering it or slowing it down if need be. Now we're in an era of the fourth industrial revolution. We've got innovation economy where the velocity has changed. So governments can no longer be reactive. They have to be proactive in the sense of working and identifying what's coming down the pipeline and also be able to help that in a way that also helps citizens. There's been a lot of talk about disruption and the workforce, and we know that there's a large percentage that are going to be affected. So even, you know, 30, 40% could be affected. Now, we don't know if that's going to be deleted or if it's just transformational. So governments have to prepare the workforce. I'm doing that actually. I'll give a shout out here to my Digital Literacy Day, which will be happening in May. That's all about digital literacy and leaving nobody behind. The idea behind that was, was the fact that you have all of this disruption coming you have AI or you have all of these uh, disruptors that are coming in, what can we do to make sure that we're future-proofing or that we're educating our residents and skilling up where we need to? And we're providing a workforce for the future, or really now. It's a huge collaboration between our educational institutions with the corporate sector, with private sector, with our public workforce, and making sure that we're preparing everybody for the future. There's so many areas that that I could go into in terms of this disruption and making sure that we're ready for it. But again, governments have to be leading the charge on that instead of trying to prevent it from happening. Michelle, we've talked a lot about um, innovation in sort of public and private on the small scale. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, like, do you have any advice for large corporations who are in Toronto or in Canada that want to get on board this innovation accelerated Mm -hmm. journey, if you will? Well, I know that it's harder for larger corporations as well, just as we're a large entity. These are slow moving ships and we're trying to write, you know, the Titanic here and turn things around. It's hard to do. So I get that the agility and the ability for the large corporation, it's not as fast. We know that from banks to even with PwC and the large corporations, they're they're phenomenal and they, I think that they do phenomenal work within the ecosystem, but it's harder for them to be as fluid and dynamic, I think. But at the same time, I think that where they add value is even through CSR. I mean, the corporate social responsibility and other ways that they really do add to the ecosystem. I think that they add a lot in terms of their innovation hubs and their innovation labs. Pretty much everybody has one. So I think that there's opportunity there and that that's where they could go um, deeper into the ecosystem in that in that regard and, and play a, a larger role. I think, if I may, yeah. a lot of the big companies are victims of their own success. Right. Because it's like, why change it if it's not broken? And I think a lot of companies fall into the sort of the, the fallacy that just because it's good now means it'll be good later. And I don't think, you know, large organizations are doing a good enough of a job of kind of using foresight or foreseeing different future possibilities where disruption can come to play and disrupt their their own businesses. It's tough because they're successful, right? So, you, you know, you bring in these innovation labs, you do these sort of side projects as potential ways to innovate or to come up with, you know, future things, but the core business isn't at risk. Right. And when it is, that's when change happens, but quite often it's a little bit too late That's because right. they're not, they're, they're, you know, a lot of big organizations, you know, if you use a highway analogy, they're in the slow lane and the more agile businesses are in the fast lane. And I'm not very good at math, but I'm sure there's some equation that says if, you know, if uh, Michelle is traveling, you know, 110 kilometers and so-and-so is traveling 50, what's the difference, right? Right. 
Well, it makes no sense, but you know what I mean. I get it. And there's the, the feeling that they're not ahead of the curve. Like they're, they want to re- maintain status quo because that's what's worked historically. I mean, it's worked and that's what's produced the big bucks. Uh, so why change that? I think it's leadership at the top. You really need to, every entity has to make sure that the leadership at the top is identifying what's coming down the, the track. And that's why I was saying with government, it's the same thing. You cannot be reactive. You cannot live in this new economy and be reactive. You just cannot do that anymore. So for all of those that are not ahead of the curve or seeing what could be or being agile and dynamic, I think that they're, they will suffer the repercussions. Yeah, I like to go on record as saying difficult is worth doing. Right, I like that. A lot of stuff, it's really hard to do this stuff. It's yeah, hard. That's it right. It takes resources, it takes effort, it takes commitment. Well, it takes but, risk. And it takes money. True, yeah. Right? And it has that, I'm gonna say fear factor because it's all about risk. And, you know, most of these companies are about risk mitigation. And how can we not, you know, how can we alleviate that or not do it instead of really putting yourself out there? And governments are the worst for it. Glad you said that. I'm going to say it. So again, historically, we have been the worst at, for example, so we would start a pilot project and no government wants to admit they were wrong. And so all of those pilot projects, guess what happens? They become reality and they roll out and they may suffer long, but they stay there because no bureaucrat or no politician wants to admit, oh, we used uh, public funds, we used taxpayer money, we did a pilot, and guess what? It didn't work. So a bit of that is educating the public to say we're in a new economy and we need to be able to hive off money in order to say there's going to be some money spent, uh, whether it be a pilot or whether it's for this change. And guess what? It may not work, but that's what we need to do because we need to be able to fail in certain areas and we need to be able to cut off pilots that don't work and, and able to admit that they didn't work. And that is a bit, again, risky. And there's a lot of fear around that because historically there's no politician that wants to go out and say it didn't work. But I'm the first to say, I'm the first to say that. I think that we need to do that. We need to educate the public on that. So I'm leading the charge in that area as well and saying we have to be able to fail. We have to be able to do things that may not work. We may, we have to be able to roll out pilots that may or may not work because that's the only way to innovate and change. We talk a lot about it in terms of, um, you know, test and learn, or we use failure as an opportunity to iterate. That's right. Because you're never going to get it right the first time. Yeah. This was super fun. Okay, good. I learned a lot. I hope our listeners learned a lot too. So thank you so much, Michelle, for spending time with us here, giving us your insights, telling us what's going on, what's exciting you about uh, Toronto as a tech hub and what we're doing. What absolutely. Do. Yeah. I mean, Toronto is where it's at. It's absolutely, it's exploding and this is the city. So uh, if you're out there, this is where you need to be. And uh, I'm so excited and uh, and happy to be to be part of it really and to be an honored really to have this role at the city and uh, especially in this time. I mean, this is really Toronto's time and and uh, I'm excited to be here at, at PwC and being a part of this conversation because in a year from now, a year and a half from now, you and I will get back together and we can look back and say, wow. We'll be holograms by then. We will be. We could be. Cyborgs. Yeah. Delivered by drones. That's right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Shift. You can get more details at pwc.com slash CA slash shift. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, subscribe to our podcast series. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, or your preferred podcast platform. Just so you know, this podcast has been prepared by PricewaterhouseCoopers LLP, an Ontario limited liability partnership for general guidance on matters of interest only and does not constitute professional advice. Until next time.